I think the biggest advice that I would give everybody is just take the time to look at your money, what's coming in and what's going out. Make sure you understand it. And that's the only way you're going to get ahead in this world. Only way. Hi, and welcome to Beyond the Paycheck. I'm Paula Christine. So I got a little bored talking to myself, so I asked my producer, Kevin, to come and co-host with me. Um, So we're going to start doing that once a month to change up a little things because, you know, talking to yourself gets kind of boring. So welcome, Kevin. Hello, Paula. How are you today? I'm living the dream. I have so this will be the second time I was on. I don't know when, and then uh, you and I had the pleasure of working together. And I think this is a a really interesting, cool idea because I don't know. Sometimes when you get asked questions, it can pull out different value that you might not think of when you're by yourself. So I'd like to just jump right in. Okay, go for as it. Co- as co-host for the day, <laughs> are you gonna I was, put me on the hot seat? I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try my best. I was thinking of this today. I was thinking of if I had the opportunity, if I didn't know you and I had the opportunity to ask somebody like you that knows what you know a question, the first question I would probably ask you is when it comes to money, okay. what is your daily thought process on whether or not to make a purchase? Like what is going on in your head when you're deciding? Oh, lots of things. Um, Well, you know, knowing me, lots of things are always going on in my head. (laughs) So, um, well, sometimes I still know that something is just that I need it. And so I just go ahead and and buy it because I've already rationalized that in my head. Maybe the days up and coming to that purchase. So it's just simple as, you know, clicking the Amazon button. But I have to think like, how is that going to affect my budget? Because I only have so much money coming in and it's allocated. Every dollar goes somewhere. So if I have to spend like, everybody knows I bought a new house and I've been pulling for my savings to, to cover that because I anticipated having that. But it's the simple things, even like buying, you know, toilet paper holders and toilet brushes and stuff for the the new bathroom. You know, you got to think where that money's going to come from. And I have to say, okay, I only have this much money this month. And in my budget, I have, say, $800 a month for miscellaneous kind of stuff. Mm. Then I have to say, do I have that? How much of that 800 do I have? And can I make that purchase? Because I don't want any credit card debt. I have none, and I don't want any. Do you think, what do you say to somebody who says that seems very constricting? It, it seems very constricting to say, I have 800, and now I'm taking 40 of that 800, so now it's down to 760. What do you say to somebody who might say that feels constricting, or it's going to feel scarce, or... Something along that lines, because I'm thinking right now I'm dieting. Very similar. I get 1,400 calories a day. Is this cookie worth 140? It is not. So I understand that that can feel constricting. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I I can imagine it could, and it probably does now that I think about it. But there's only so much money. So what are you going to (laughs) do? You know, if you don't have it, you don't have it. So you have to use it wisely. You have to think about your purchases. So let's say I didn't add that up. And then I got to the end of the month and I spent $1,200 instead of $800. Where's that other 400 going to come from? Yeah. So Credit you have cards. To, yeah. And now, now it's 400 this month. Maybe it's 500 the next month. And if I overspend, it isn't going to magically appear next month. Or maybe if I overspent the four hundred, then I gotta take it from my eight hundred dollars next month. Well then that only leaves me four hundred for the whole you know what I mean? It, it just it gets to be this you just have to do it. I don't know how else to say it, but yeah. You just have to do it and you have to be disciplined and and you know, budget in stuff like that for you know, fun stuff. But if you live if you truly live correctly it's every dollar is accounted for. So maybe you, you know, if you feel you don't want to be as, you know, constricted, then maybe that $800 should be more for you so that you don't have to worry about it. And if you have extra, you know, put it in savings and you use it for the next time. What do you think the most common misconceptions about credit cards are? 
most common misconceptions about credit cards. I think people use credit cards not understanding how interest works mm. and how that's, you know, I, I don't know what the current interest rates are in credit cards now, but I'm going to imagine it's probably in the 20s. Well, just think about that. <laughs> and most people think that, you know, eventually they're going to get out, that, you know, it's just a temporary thing. And, you know, I just need to use my credit card now because it's an emergency and I'll get out, I'll get, catch it up. But you just don't, unless you make a conscious effort to catch it up you're not going to. And then before you know it, you've got, you know, a thousand dollars and then you've got 5,000 and then you've got 10,000 and then catching up becomes really difficult. So what do you, what, what advice would you give to someone? Cause obviously uh, pretty much the through line of everything we talk about is going to be, there has to be some sort of budget and you've got to know how much is coming in and how much is going out. Right. That's right. Yeah. we got to start there. If somebody, what advice would you give to somebody who's not looking at any of their numbers? They don't know what their credit card balance is. They don't know how much they have in the bank. They don't know their expenses. How do you start that process without being extremely overwhelmed? Because that's probably an overwhelming process. Well, I do have a course on my website called oh. Budget Tracker. Oh, ah, that was a nice tie in there. <laughs> <laughs> but you can take, I think it's... Um, um, send me an email and I'll get you the discount to get it for $27, but it takes you and starts you off and how to build that budget. And it's just a, it's a simple step-by-step -step approach. It's not as difficult as you think to build your budget. You just have to want to, just have to want to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and you get an eye opening, um, rudely <laughs> when you start to look at what you've been spending. But if you don't know, then how do you know that you're how do you, if you don't know if you don't know what's coming in you don't know what's going out how do you how do you manage to live i mean you just yeah well you i got think lucky. that's where anxiety <laughs> yeah and i think that's what i think that's where a lot of the anxiety can come from because if you don't know you just it's like oh, i don't i think we're going to be good Ooh, what a scary way to live i think yeah unfortunately i think a lot of people they do i had a client one time who i said how much money is in your bank account she didn't know her business bank account. She hadn't looked at it in like 10 years. Yeah. Hmm. What so you, she could have had $100,000 or she could have had 10. She had, I think she had 25. She had way more money in there than she thought. So she had been living from this filter that was completely off. 25000 or $25? 25000 Okay. Yeah, she was doing pretty well. She was yeah. doing pretty well. What do you... What is your definition of money mindset? Like, what does that mean? What does money mindset mean to you? And how has your money mindset changed over the years of you doing this? Oh, I used to have a scarcity mindset. I never thought there was going to be enough. I think we talked about this before. And I talk mm -hmm. about it all the time, actually. It's part of the, in the course that we have called Money Making Matters. It's number one module. Number one is understanding your mindset. And until you do that, you can't really go forward and you have to take it if it's a negative and change it into a positive. And mine was very negative. I mean, I grew up what I thought to be poor. Um, and then you may ask my mom and dad, they, they might agree, but we, I thought we were poor. I know my mom was robbing Peter to pay Paul all the time. But, um, and so I took that into my adulthood. And when you live like that, when you're afraid of money, and I was, then it's really difficult to be successful. And once I changed that mindset to start looking at is that all I'm going to have all the money that I need, I say to myself every day, and I'm probably going to blow it now, and it is, I'm so very grateful that abundance comes to me easily and effortlessly and on a continuous and everyday basis. And I believe that. And since I started saying those words to myself and changing the way that I feel, I don't worry. The anxiety is gone. It's not that I don't sit down and track my money. I still do all those things, but I just don't seem to worry about it anymore. And I don't have that feeling that the shoe's going to fall or not, not the shoe. Is that, what is, what's that saying? The shoe's going to. I think the other shoe is going to fall. Yeah. yeah. I don't have that feeling anymore because I changed the way that I, that I believed and I believe that everything is going to work out. And a lot of people will go on, you know, that's not true. You know, that's. Just because I, I change my mindset, I'm I'm not going to get out of debt. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. But it's surprising how it does work. And I know you're big into mindset too. So, Yeah. Yeah. I, how does somebody know? How does somebody know that they have... 
I won't say that they have any type of mindset. How do they identify what type of money mindset they have? Actually, I think it's kind of easy um, is look at the way that your parents thought and the things that they said to, to themselves and to you as, as you were growing up. And, you know, maybe you were fortunate to have those parents who were, didn't worry about money. You know, they didn't argue over money. They, you know, they thought very positive of it. Then you likely have a positive mindset about money. But how many of us grew up with our parents fighting over money and, you know, feeling you didn't have enough or, you know, if that's the way you grew up and that's the way you felt, chances are it's probably a negative mindset. It might not be a horrible negative mindset, but it's it. you have some feelings about money that you need to let go of. What is your thought on... I was thinking of this today. You know how one of the, the things to do is to go through your expenses and figure out, do you really need Disney Plus and Amazon Prime and Netflix and this and this and this and this and this and this? What is the balance between comfort, living comfortably in terms of like having access to certain things, and the certainty it brings not having that stuff? So just as an example... When we were, we're focused on our budget, we have a business budget, we have a personal budget, and I literally got rid of YouTube TV. $74 a month, I don't watch it that much. That's a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? That's like 900 bucks a year. That's a, that's a dinner out. <laughs> yeah, that's a dinner out. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of things. It, it was very hard for me to cut that because I felt like I was getting rid of some of the comfort that I had built into my life. So there was like an internal struggle with that. What advice would you give to somebody who's trying to make challenging cuts to be more certain in their finances? Well, there's I think there's some logical cuts that people can make first or start looking at things differently. So let's talk about insurance for a second. I mean, how many when's the last time I'm just going to ask you last time you shopped your auto and homeowners insurance? You'd be so proud of my wife yesterday, oh. literally yesterday. <laughs> So, I mean, you have to do that. Did she save money? We, Paula, we are saving $200 a month. There you go. There's your, uh, there's your YouTube TV. Right. You didn't have to get and rid of it. <laughs> she just switched her, she just switched her phone and she's saving a hundred bucks a month. Yeah. When you start looking, there's ways to cut on other things like, you know, cable TV. If you have that, I don't, I have just internet, but you know, when you, I know for for me it was Comcast you used to have to call every year and threaten them that you're going to leave them and they'll drop drop your your price and you can do that on a lot of things and you can look for discounts and you know so maybe you get rid of YouTube TV right now because it's summer and you're not watching a lot of TV but you know come January when the when the weather's crappy and you want to watch more TV you get it for January February March and then you get rid of it again so what I do is, um, for me, is I go in, a, like, I wanted to watch that show. It was on Stars. It's, oh, I can't think of the name of it, but I wanted to watch it. So when I waited for the, um, waited for the season to air, the entire season to air, then I went and got a free week of um, Stars, <laughs> and I watched the, I just binge watched it, and then I mm. canceled it. Probably shouldn't say that on TV, or we're, we're not on TV, but, you know, on podcast. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but, what, what are they going to do? Yeah. If anything, they might say, you know what? We applaud you for your for your intelligence around that decision. But I do, I, I look at things like that. Um, you know, it, it's, it sucks sometimes having to give up something that you really enjoy. But there are plenty of things, I think, in your budget that you don't really enjoy doing. Like some people get the gym membership every January. And then they never go. So why not get rid of that? Yeah. I mean, you just got to really take a hard line and look. And if there are things that you like to do and you don't want to give up, then figure out how to increase your income. So what is your what is your thought on side side hustles? I think everybody should have some sort of passive income. Wouldn't yeah. it be nice if you got to wake up every day and you had enough passive income coming in that covered your expenses and then you go to work and your boss is, you know, you hate your job and your boss gets in your under your skin and you can just say, I don't have to be here because I have enough income coming in through passive income 
that will pay my expenses, that I don't have to be in a job that I don't like anymore. Mm -hmm. And then go find something else that you enjoy. So as long as you have the ability to generate multiple resources of income, I think that's great. And there's everybody has a talent. Just got to figure out what it is. When it comes to the advice that people are being given from, let's just say, experts in the financial space. We're not going to call anybody out. I don't want to do that. But what do you think some of the most common negative negative advice people are getting is where they're being misled? Putting you on, really putting you on the spot. Yeah. What would I think? Um, I try not to pay much attention to others. I think you have to be worried about people's advice that are trying to um, trying to say it's one. It's it's what what's the word I want? It's whatever. It's going to work for everybody. It it doesn't work for everybody. You know the way that that I may my may budget or manage my money or invest may not make sense for you at all. So I think a lot of people are it's like like you know buy this book, do this, do that. This is this is the best way. And I mean I have my own courses, and I you know so I throw myself under the bus too, I guess. But um, it's just finding that 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 works for you. And I think the the worst advice people get is not from people like me but from their coworkers or their family members or, you know, people who have an, an agenda that isn't in their best interest. You know, when you think about the coworker who says, you know, you need to buy XYZ stock, it's going to double and then you go and do it and you and you lose it. Just just because your coworker thinks he's great with money doesn't mean he's makes he yeah. mean he's great with money. <laughs> Might have got lucky once. Yeah. Yeah. So I I don't know that I would say that. I just don't think everybody's advice is good for everybody. I think you need to find people that you trust and you resonate with and and then you feel that you can take what they're suggesting, suggesting, I can't say that word, and, and implement it. But I, I don't know that I would throw anybody under the bus, but I'm sure somebody would likely throw me. <laughs> well, not me. If you got thrown under the bus, I'd pull you right out of that. Right yeah. out of that bad, Larry. Let's say somebody is going through some sort of life crisis. That way, at least we can make it specific, right? So it's like, if you are going through this, maybe this advice will resonate with you. Let's say it's a hospital visit. Uh, medical, m- just med- medical stuff in general is super expensive. What is the plan for that? Well, how does somebody work through something like that? That's a toughie. Well, hopefully you have health insurance and you don't have a big medical expense that way. But I think if you know and understand how your insurance works, so let's just go, I'll talk about mine for a second. So I pay $595 a month. I have a $7,000 deductible. And so before anything gets covered, I have to pay $7,000. So I know that I have to have set aside $7,000. After that $7,000 is my deductible is met, then everything is covered 100%. Mm-hmm. But I got to get that seven. So for me, it's I have to know that that $7,000 is there. So if anything happens, then I don't have to worry about it. I have that money. So it's just about being prepared. So, But let's say you don't then all I suggest is that you call the um, hospital after your visit and say, you know, I can only afford $100 a month towards this, you know, $5,000 bill. I know it's going to take me 50 months to pay it off, but I will pay you $100 a month. And they will do that. Mm. They will take that money. They just want to get paid. Interesting. So, they, so is that their perspective? Is $100 a well, month Well, whatever is it is, you know... It, but if you work with them, they'll work with you. It's just if you try to to, you know, not pay it, then they're going to come after you, and then it's going to hit your credit report, and then it's going to affect mm-hmm. everything else in your life. So just work are there with them. Any other? Are there any other places 
whether it's credit card companies, uh, loan companies for vehicles, are there any other places where you can have a conversation with them and they'll work with you on stuff like that? I don't know. Um, I would think so. I mean, I know sometimes I think the utilities will, will work with you a little bit. I know in the city of Detroit, they always have every year, you know, come in and help, they'll help you with your property taxes if you can't afford them. So I'm assuming they must put it, I've never gone, but I'm assuming they must, must help them out in some ways. I don't think it hurts to ask for anything. Yeah. I mean, I ask for everything and it drives people nuts, but how do you know? What's the worst thing that they can say is no, but what if they say yes? You know, ask yeah. for everything. I always think of it like if, if forbid this was to happen, but if you had a little, a little child, a child of yours, they had some sort of health condition, you would ask every question under the sun. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? What's the medication? What does the medication do? What are the symptoms? Blah, blah, blah. But I think sometimes we forget to do that for ourselves in, in specific valuable situations. So I think that's a really good point. Oh, I ask for, um, I ask for the stupidest stuff, you know. Let's hear it. You know, like, you know, um, like I'm 58, soon to be 59 in a couple of weeks. But um, I always, do you have a senior discount? And they'll say like, oh, you have to be 62. Okay. Well, I got a few more years, but sometimes it's 50. I mean, who knew at 50 you could get a senior to citizen's discount? I'm 50. So if you're not asking... You know, you're paying extra. I think it's, um, I know we have Myers here. I don't know if you have Myers where you live, but mm -mm. I think on a certain day they have um, for 50, I think it's 55, you get a 10% discount for being a senior. I believe it's 10%. I mean, 55. I know that that to me is like, I don't want to be, be a senior. <laughs> <laughs> but at that moment, I mean, movie theaters um, will give you a discount. But I ask for everything. Do you, do you have a discount? Can I get that? Is that going on sale at any time soon? You know, I just ask for, you know, you go to a hotel. Can I be upgraded? I mean, do you have free breakfast? Like, just ask for everything. Worst thing they're going to say is no. But sometimes they do say yes. What is What has been the... Has there been a time where you asked for something, not expecting to get it, and got it? Or just I had a feeling you were going to ask that, so I was <laughs> trying to think of some story that or something that happened. Um, no, I can't think of one off the top of my head. But I'll tell you this: I was really surprised too when I moved and changed my address. The at the post office, they had this thing like my move or something like that. I can't remember the name of it, but I was thinking about getting a security system and was simply safe. And so I've been pricing it out and, and through that, I got like 50% off by just accepting to receive their emails. And I got 50% off my security system. And I mean, that was pretty huge. So instead of paying $1,400 for the thing, I had to pay seven and that's, a That's a lot of money. Yeah, because my landscapers are now using that seven hundred dollars. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Is there is there anything on? I know we want to keep these relatively short. That's the thing. I'll keep you here all day. It's this. This is my jam. I love this. Is there anything on your mind right now that you think would be valuable to the audience? Anything you're experiencing? Someone close to you is experiencing something new you learned? Just kind of as a sign off. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, I'll just say what I've learned over the last two months since I moved is, is you know, really, I'm grateful that I had a good team behind me with my, my broker, my real estate agent, my insurance broker, and helping me look at how to, to buy the home differently than what I traditionally thought was 20% down. You know what I mean? I was, I, and I ended up only putting 5% down and then taking the money that I was going to put down on the house. And I used it to do 
the improvements and because they knew I was going to refinance anyway in a few years because interest rates are so high right now. Yeah. And then, you know, I would be able to then put money, put the 20% down and then refinance and get a lower interest rate. And a woman did ask me that question um, yesterday when we were doing a, a, a webinar for the Budget for Groceries webinar that we were doing live yesterday. She asked me that question, do you do you buy a house now even though interest rates are so high or do you wait for them to go down? And I said, you buy. Because if it's your dream home, then buy it because it's not going to be there when interest rates go down. So buy it and then just refinance. So I also learned that it's important to stop and think before you make decisions. And normally I do that, but you know, I had so much going on and I wanted so much done because I'm a little, you know, want it done kind of person Mm -hmm. that I ended up in some circumstances making a decision that if I would have thought it through, I likely would have made the same decision, but would have made it a little bit better. For example, like when I put the patio, cement patio on the back of the house, I don't have a lot of room back there. So I did it um, 10 feet wide and just an extra foot longer would have been so much better because when you try to fit furniture (laughs) in a 10 feet section and then, you know, I like, I try to think of everything. I thought, okay, if the table is this big and people push their chairs all the way from it and then I, you know, like how far would you measure? And then I'm like, but that still only gives you like this amount of space to walk around when the table's full. I mean, I tried to think of all those things, but in making that decision because I wanted it done, I would have probably likely have made it another foot. So Mm. I don't know. It's just like, I think too, for me, it's having people to talk to about things. And I struggle with that being single and not that I need a man in my life. I'm not saying that, but it's nice to have someone to bounce things off of. Yeah. For sure. You know, so my, last question. One more, one more quick. Okay. Nothing's quick with me. <laughs> no, no. Well, yeah. Same with me. I say it'll be a quick question. It'll probably be a five minute question. Would you suggest that approach with, again, it's hard to give advice based on specifics. We, we, we already kind of alluded to that. It, do you think it's dangerous for somebody to get a house now with the mortgage rates as high as they are with the understanding that, well, you know what, I can float this for two years and then I'll refinance? Like, what if something happens? I guess, what's the thought process there in terms of how on a scale of zero to 10, how comfortable and certain do you have to be that you can afford the monthly payment? Because that's what's going to end up crushing you over right. time. So I knew I can afford it. If the interest rates never went down, I still knew that I can afford it. Okay. So that's the, the cross is yes, eventually these interest rates should go down. And when they do, you can refinance. But if they don't, make sure you're not hinging on that, whether or not yeah. you're not out. And when I think too, when people forget when they're when they're purchasing a home. So let's say their mortgage payment was $2,000 a month. But you have to remember that the mortgage company is basing your taxes on the current tax bill. And they don't know what your tax bill is going to be when, when you change ownership into your name. They can, you want to make sure that you kind of get that. So I know that I'm putting away an extra $200 a month into a savings account right now because I know my taxes are likely to go up $2,400 next year based on what they kind of figured out for me. So I know my house payment automatically is going to go up $200 next year. I already know that. So I've been making that payment to myself, although I've been putting that, you know, that $200 and then just making my regular mortgage payment. So I had to know what that was and know that I can afford that for the rest of, if I had to, for the rest of my life. I'm glad we went into that because I think that's, 
I, I think it's easily a common mistake to say, yeah, you know, because I think that's what happens with cars. It's like, yeah, I can afford five hundred fifty dollars a month right now, but if you want to leave your job or change your job, then you're tied into that five fifty for the next however long. So, well, yeah, I okay. think I anything. Think, oh, go ahead. In, when I talk to people about moving, when they're about moving jobs, it's like you have to know what you can afford what your income is that you have not what you can afford but what income you have to make to 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 be successful to where you can pay your bills still have your savings goals still do all those things and then you have to start looking and that's when you start asking you know if you you know if you need thirty dollars an hour then ask for thirty dollars an hour after 35 and settle for 30. you never know you might get it but you have to know um what you want to do but we all could get in that situation where even though I have a mortgage payment, a car payment, that something happens and I can't, you know, let's knock on wood that that does not happen, but it could happen. But having yourself protected with disability insurance is huge. Having an emergency account is huge. If you have those two things, then if you lost your job, at least you know you can survive for a certain period of time until you can find something. And then if you get injured, not just at work or just, um, you know, fall off a ladder and, and break your leg or something, you know, you have disability that's going to get you through to make your payments. Those two, are, those two things are very important. I don't know. I'm going to put you on the spot. Kevin, do you have disability insurance? No. You need it. <laughs> I definitely do. Look, I'm not the host here. You know, I'm not the expert. I'm not the expert. I'm messing up all that. That's why I'm asking the questions. <laughs> well, next time we talk, no, you don't. need to have disability insurance. I will. It's not will that expensive. That it's not that. I, I've, if I've learned anything, it's like um, life insurance isn't is nearly as expensive as I thought. I'm sure disability insurance isn't. Almost nothing is as ex Well, I won't say that. Some things are way more expensive than I thought, and other things are way less expensive than I thought. Oh, term insurance is so cheap. And mm. I always get in this debate with people all the time because there's people that think you should invest in, you know, those cash value life insurance policies and, you know, you can take money out and take loans and all this stuff. But I'm like term insurance. It's everybody should have it. I mean, someone in your age can probably get a million dollar term insurance for next to nothing. I think it was like 10. I don't remember. My wife gave me the number. I don't know what it is. You seem to rely on your wife and that's a big no, no. So, <laughs> <laughs> we're we are been we've been going through a we're focused on a lot of financial goals so she's been heading that where i've been heading the make more money portion yeah. but <laughs> but you should um you do know where all your money all the bills are and what they are and okay yes yeah you'd be surprised yeah. at the Two number of people a sickening amount yeah you'd be surprised at the number of people who their spouse passes away and they have no clue yeah. No clue. So you need to sit down. I think, I think everybody should sit down for an hour once a week over coffee or cocktails and just here's where we are today. This is how we're doing towards our goals. Has anything changed? Keep it to one cocktail, not five, <laughs> because then who knows what happens after the the fourth <laughs> or the fifth. All right. Anything, anything we didn't talk about? Anything you want to close with? You do you. What do I want to close with? Actually put you back I know you're putting me on the spot a lot today I think if we do this you have to give me pre questions in advance <laughs> I, I, we can do it next time I'm I, just kidding we, I'm uh, just Paul kidding I, I'm just kidding well if if that's the case we Paul and I had a conversation before we we're like let's just see what happens I don't know what's going to happen but let's see what happens we'll have a conversation no I think it's been a good conversation good um, same so I think the biggest advice that I would give everybody is just take the time to Look at your money, what's coming in and what's going out. Make sure you understand it. And that's the only way you're going to get ahead in this world. Only way. I wish there was a different way, but it's the only way. I would concur with that. Right on. So make sure you include your spouse and your children when you're having that conversation. That's a good point. Okay. We are done, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I didn't know if you wanted to sign off in a certain uh, we way. Should. But we're, I'm good when um, you're good. How are we going to sign off in this new approach here? Um, I don't know. Check out my website, Paula. Paula. No, that's my email. If you want to reach me, 
you can reach me at paula at paulachristine.com or check out the website at paulachristine.com. Hey, you know what? Perfect. If anybody wants to be a guest, email me and we'll put you on the hot seat. Or you'll put me on the hot seat. I won't put you, but you'll put me on the hot seat. <laughs> Perfect. Okay.